Welcome, welcome. Glad you guys are here or at your home groups uh, and your leaders' homes, wherever you guys are at. Uh, so appreciate you guys jumping in this fall and, and being a part of, of what we're doing and what God is building here. We've been spending the last few weeks talking about decision making. We've been looking at scripture and what it says and the lives of people in here. And we've looked at a lot of, of sinful decisions and obedient decisions. And I want to start tonight. Uh, if I can, w- talking about a scene from a movie, uh, and if I'm able to, I will put it in uh, in here with if my editing skills are up to the task. But uh, there's an old movie, and it's uh, called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Indiana Jones, if you don't know, is, uh, I believe, a history teacher, and he's an adventurer, always going off on quests to kind of discover things. And in this particular movie, he's in a race against some bad guys, some Nazis, uh, to find the Holy Grail. But in order to get to the Holy Grail, he faces a series of tests, uh, including crossing an impossible pit. And so he's on one side of this cliff and he's looking down and and it's like this impossible chasm to get across. And he has to get uh, across it in order to get to the Holy Grail. And if I'm able to, I'll show the movie clip now. And if not, I'll just explain what happens. And so as he's standing here on the cliff looking across, he has like this book of clues, I think, or, or kind of things that will help him find the Holy Grail. And it says that it's a step of faith. And so what Indiana Jones has to do is take a step off this ledge into this pit, put his foot forward, and once it lands, his foot hits an invisible bridge because, of course. And so there's this invisible bridge that he would only have known was there had he stepped forward and taken that step of faith. As we've been talking about decision-making the last few weeks, uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit differently about that. You see, we've talked a lot about sinful decisions or righteous, obedient decisions, and that's good. We face so many situations where we're choosing between sin and obeying God, and the Bible talks a ton about wisdom and sin and all these decisions that we have to make. But there's another category of decision-making, and it's not always as clear as this one's wrong and this one's right. But this is a category of decision-making when we don't know what to do. Now, certainly there could be times that we don't know what to do and we choose to sin. But more often, I think it's uh, like this. What college should I apply to? Or I got accepted by three colleges. Where should I go? What should I do with this relationship? How do I help this person in need? How can I live my faith in a family who doesn't agree with me? Uh, should I share my faith with this friend of mine who is, uh, believes a different religion? You see, these decisions are not always between right and wrong and, and sin and not sin, and they require wisdom. And so we're going to look at this tonight by looking at a part of the life of a man named Nehemiah. So if you brought your Bibles tonight, and I hope you did, or you have your phones, I'd turn to Nehemiah in the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapters 1 and 2 tonight. But I want to give you some background as we jump in here. Uh, so we know what's going on with this story. Israel, God's people, are in their homeland, okay? Uh, Now, this is way after King David. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about King David, and uh, so this is many kings later, and, and a lot of things have changed. But Israel's in their homeland, and this is the same exact land, if you remember Moses, Uh, the promised land where God brought his people after they were slaves in Egypt. So they're in the promised land. And then they decide to disobey God and the people of Israel uh, kind of lose their faith in him, in their actions, in the way they live. And and they're invaded and conquered by an enemy nation called the Babylonians. So the Babylonians come in and they take Israel captive. They take them out of their homeland and bring them back to the land where the Babylonians are from. And now they're in captivity there. Well, after a few years, if you know your history, I don't. I had to look this up. But uh, Cyrus the Great leads the Persian Empire into battle against the Babylonians. And they conquer them. So track with it from Israel's perspective. They're now far from home. They've gone into Babylonian captivity, but then the people who invaded and captured them have been invaded and captured by now the Persians. And so it's like twice removed almost, that they are in a foreign country ruled by the Persians and still in captivity, or as the Bible calls it, exile. God sent them in exile from the promised land. 
And if you think about Moses and, and all that he did and, and the promised land and what God had told him, I mean, if you think about their situation now, this is not how the Israelites saw things going, right? That they have a promised land flowing with milk and honey. They've been given to it by God. He's going to build them into a great nation. They have these kings that defeat giants and enemy nations, and everything's going well until they walk away from God. And now they're in a foreign land far from their home, But God has promised his people they would be a nation in the promised land. And God has not forgotten his promise, and God always keeps his promises. And so God begins to slowly rebuild his people from exile. And he does this first by sending a man named Zerubbabel, uh, which is a great name, baby name. Write that down for your futures. Uh, A man named Zerubbabel, and he he sends him back home to rebuild the temple, the place of worship in the promised land. And then God calls a man named Ezra, the book of the Bible named after him. He calls a man named Ezra to go back and help rebuild the community of God's people and the laws of God's people. And God's people are slowly becoming God's people again. And if you were a Jew or an Israelite, you would start to hear rumors that, man, Israel is getting back together. God is growing the nation and the land again. And this is where the story of Nehemiah takes place. We're going to look at Nehemiah. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. That's kind of from Israel. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah in chapter one here, Nehemiah is in a Persian city. And it says he's in the citadel, which means he's working in the palace of the Persian king. So if you remember our first week, it's not so different than Joseph, who was sold into slavery and ended up working in Potiphar's house. He is working in the palace of the Persian king. And one of his brothers comes to the city and they get together and Nehemiah says, Hey, I've heard these rumors. I've heard that Israel is getting the band back together, that that God is rebuilding the nation. Like, how's it going? Give me an update from our homeland. And his brother actually says, Well, the news is not good. The city of Jerusalem, the capital, the most important city in the promised land, has no walls and no gates. So let's pause and talk about this for a second because uh, Missoula has no walls and no gates. And so should we be raising the alarm? Is this like, should we be concerned about this? Uh, And here's the reality. In ancient times, you were basically always at risk of another king showing up and conquering, conquering you. Like that could just happen at any day. And so here in Missoula, we're not really worried about Billings coming in and conquering us and taking us back to eastern Montana, which would be terrible. Uh, right, But we're not afraid of that, and so we don't have walls and gates, and we don't need a defense for that. But if you think about it, this is exactly what had happened to Israel already. They had been conquered and taken from their land, and their city and defenses were destroyed. And so for the last 50 years or so, Israel slowly started becoming a nation again. Because God is a promise-keeping God, people are getting, uh, he's bringing people back to the promised land, he's growing them as a nation, and for the very first time in a long time, for the people of Israel, for God's people, there was hope. There was hope about this baby nation growing again. So Nehemiah is here, and, and he hears the news now that there's no walls. And so his hope starts to just get crushed a little bit, because it means that all this work All the coming back together of God's people has no defense. At any moment, another enemy nation could come in and could crush this this fledgling, this baby nation that's trying to grow again. It would be like saying we have a brand new puppy and we put it in the backyard, but we don't have a fence. Or maybe even more severe, it would be like saying we have a, a baby or a toddler, but we have no baby fences or gates. The stairs are wide open, the doors are wide open. I mean, this is uh, the beginning of, of Israel being rebuilt, and they have no protection, no guards, no walls. Nehemiah is faced with the situation, and he doesn't know what to do. He sees something wrong, and he knows something is wrong, and it's so wrong that he has to do something. And yet, let's see what he does in verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, 
I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here's what we see. Nehemiah has to make a decision, a big decision, and he doesn't know exactly what it is. He knows there's a problem, and and he knows that he has to act and do something, but the first thing he does is he seeks God. We're going to see kind of two different points from his life tonight about what Nehemiah does and, and how that impacts us today, but I want to show you the very first thing that we see is that wise decision making takes patiently seeking God. If we want to be wise decision makers and we have things before us and we don't know what to do, it takes patiently seeking God. Becoming a wise decision maker doesn't happen by accident. People don't just accidentally start making good decisions. We can stumble into one every now and then, but it takes patience. And if we're being honest, we're all pretty bad at patience. I mean, our entire culture has kind of set itself up to eliminate waiting, to eliminate patience. And it takes seeking God. Nehemiah could have rushed into a decision, but instead he knew the most important thing he could do was seek God first. And it says he fasted and he prayed. And and fasting is basically foregoing food, not eating for a, a certain amount of time, and using that time and that hunger to direct you back towards God. And to pray and to seek his will. When it comes to decisions that we face, how often do we spend time seeking God about what to do? How do we seek God in decision making? And I think sometimes we can say, well, turn to God or seek God. And, and that's like Christianese. And it's like, well, okay, what does that actually mean? How do we seek God in decision making? Well, it's really through prayer and through God's word. A couple of verses I want to share. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is famous. It says, do not be anxious about anything, including decision making, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Instead of worrying, which we're prone to do, I'm, I'm prone to do, God tells us to pray, to seek him. Nehemiah could have stressed, and he was human, like I'm sure there was some fear and some uncertainty and some stress. He could have Googled what to do. I'm a big fan of that. I Google what to do often. He could have pan, uh, panicked or flipped a coin. But instead, he prays. Wise decision-making takes patiently seeking God. When was the last time you prayed about a decision? Man, that can be a convicting question when I think there's so many times I just make a decision and I kind of trust what I know, and and we'll talk about that in a bit. And, And I think, man, I didn't slow down and pray. I didn't seek God. I didn't slow down. I wasn't patient and thought about what God would want me to do in that situation. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When we seek God, we have the added benefit of his word. God has not concealed his will from us. He's not trying to hide from us and and leave us wondering, like, man, what does God want me to do? What does he want my life to look like? What does he want me to live? He's given us his word. And that verse tells us the Bible is like a lamp in the darkness or a torch in a cave that it shows us the way to go. Not by flipping through and being like, okay, which store should I go to? Where should I get lunch today? Right? Not like that, but showing us how God has called us to live. That he has not hidden anything he wants us to know in his word. And so we know where to walk. We know how to make decisions. And if you think about that Philippians verse, the promise here, and this is really important, The promise from God, if we seek him patiently in prayer, is not that he'll rip open the heavens and and speak to us audibly. It's not that you'll drive down the street and see a big sign that says what God wants you to do. It doesn't mean he'll speak to you from a burning bush. Certainly he's capable of any of those things. But the promise in Philippians is peace. It says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have the promise of peace if we pray And we have the promise of the light of God's guiding word if we seek him in that. Wise decision making takes patiently seeking God through prayer and through scripture. We're going to move on to the second part here of Nehemiah's life. And Nehemiah has has heard of a problem. He needs to make a decision and he patiently seeks God first. And we're going to turn to Nehemiah now, chapter 2. If you'd like to read all that Nehemiah prayed, you can read the remainder of chapter 1. Here's what Nehemiah 2 says. 
Now I was cupbearer to the king in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. When wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing as you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. So here Nehemiah knows his people at home are in trouble, and it's bothering him. And he's going to work, and his face is down, and he's discouraged, and he's patiently seeking for God what to do, but it's, it's hurting, it's torturing him. He's, he's concerned, and he's in front of the king, and the king is at least good with people and can read and go, okay, something's not right with my cupbearer. Something's not right in his life. And he says a, a great line, this is sadness of the heart. Sometimes the sadness of our heart can show on our face. And he says, what's wrong? What's going on? Why are you sad? And then Nehemiah says he's very afraid. He doesn't say that to the king. He says, here, I was afraid when the king said this to me. Well, why is he afraid? Because he knows if the king doesn't like his answer, it could mean his imprisonment or his death. But his time of seeking God has prepared him for this moment. I want you to hear that. We have moments that are scary and difficult. And yet what happens here and what happens throughout scripture is God prepares people for those moments. And God has been preparing Nehemiah for this moment every time Nehemiah sought him and prayed and fasted. And verse 3, here it goes. It says, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So Nehemiah stops and explains. He says, my home, where I'm from, is in ruins. And that makes me sad. I, I'm bothered. I'm upset. And the king stops him and says, well, what do you want to do? What are you asking for? And the next verse is awesome. Nehemiah 2.5, it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, pause. Nehemiah is faced with a scary situation. The king says, what are you asking? And Nehemiah throws up what I like to call lightning prayer. He says, I prayed and then I spoke. He didn't have a ton of time to wash his hands, to get out his kneeler, to lay down, to say, Heavenly Father, thou art great. I am seeking thy will today. The king has just spoken to me. Please uh, speak to me so I might find in thee. Right. He didn't say one of these big, eloquent, flowery prayers. He was probably like, oh my gosh, God, help me. God, I need your help right now. And then he spoke. Sometimes we don't go to God or we're afraid to pray because we don't know what to say or we don't sound as good as somebody else. I mean, Nehemiah probably sounded like, oh, oh, God, help me, please. I'm not prepared for this moment. He says, I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, then you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah is faced with a difficult choice of what to do. And so he prays, God, help me. And then he takes a step of faith. He takes a step of faith. This is the second part of our, our main point tonight, is that wise decisions, uh, wise decision making takes steps of faith. Nehemiah has sought God. He clearly has thought about what he should do, about what's going on. And yet he has not heard a clear voice of God speaking to him, telling him what to do. And then he's put in a situation where he has to make a decision. As we talk about steps of faith tonight, I want you to know a step of faith is not like a blind leap. It's not a foolish decision. It's not that Nehemiah hadn't sought God. I mean, he's been praying, he's been fasting, and he doesn't quite know what to do. And yet he takes a step of faith and he risks a lot. He hasn't necessarily heard God speak to him like God spoke to Moses and said, go, go rescue my people and I'll send you to the promised land. God didn't speak to Nehemiah that way. And Nehemiah is here and he has to take a step of faith. He prays, he says, help me, and he takes a step of faith. Think about Indiana Jones stepping out into the bottomless pit, taking a step of faith. Nehemiah wasn't guaranteed a specific outcome of him speaking to the king this way. I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of scary. He's asking this king, his boss and his king, well, his captive king, uh, and he's asking to leave and to go home and rebuild the walls of an enemy nation. 
I mean, the king could have seen that as disloyal. He could have seen it as selfish. I mean, he could have killed Nehemiah. He could have thrown him in prison. But Nehemiah took a step of faith, and it was scary, and he didn't know the outcome. It's sometimes we look at these stories in the Bible, and because we know what happens, we're like, well, yeah, Nehemiah spoke up, and things go well, and whatever. Nehemiah had no idea how this was going to go. He'd been seeking God. He hadn't gotten the answer, like a clear answer, but he knew it was going to take a step of faith. And after seeking God, he believed he had to take this step. Proverbs 3.5 is a helpful verse as we talk about this. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We're just going to talk about this verse for a second and then get back to Nehemiah. Man, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. How much of our life is lived based on our own understanding of how we understand things to work? I'm thinking about my daughter, Bree. She's two and a half. She makes decisions based on her limited understanding. She understands this much of the world. I make decisions based on my greater knowledge of the world. I know more than my daughter does, and that's how I make my decisions. And when I don't know what to do, I will ask someone that knows more than me, that has lived longer than me, that has greater life experience, has greater understanding. And for being honest, uh, as teenagers, oftentimes we're experiencing some of the early stages of adulthood. We have more independence and freedom, and we're growing at a rapid rate. And we can start to think that we know best, right? I mean, I was that way. It's okay to admit that to yourself. That as teenagers, we can often think, man, I, my understanding is greater than my parents. They don't understand this. My understanding is greater than these youth leaders. My understanding is greater than my peers. My understanding is greater than my siblings, whatever. And there can sometimes kind of be this like, you know, flexing of this new independence of of, of growing up. And we think, man, I have a ton of understanding. That's I'm going to make my decisions. But this verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on just what you know. Because if we only make decisions based on our limited understanding, we're going to miss so much of what God has for us. You see, a step of faith is not blind or foolish. It is the willful choosing to trust the outcome to God and not just how you understand things. Does that make sense? I hope it does. That a step of faith is not a blind, foolish decision. It's actively choosing to say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust you and your good character and your promises for the result of this decision. There are many, many choices Christians make that if you were to ask the world, make no sense. They make no sense. But we don't just lean on our own understanding. There's a bunch of examples of this, but one that I thought of that I hear often uh, is this idea of um, the the average age of marriage is is really high. It's been higher than it's been in a long time in our country or maybe ever, I don't know. Um, And that means people are getting married later, older. And by that by itself, that's no big deal. God doesn't say marry young or marry old. But what's happening is as people are pushing marriage off further, they're going through all of these like trial phases of like mini marriages. And here's what I mean by that. You'll hear often, well, why would I ever marry somebody that I haven't lived with? I want to make sure that we get along as roommates. And so people will move in together and kind of pretend to be married and and see how that goes. And people will say, well, I can't imagine marrying somebody without ever living with them. Like that seems foolish. Their own understanding is that it's best to test someone out first before you marry them. Uh, People will sleep together, and you'll even hear people say, like, well, I want to make sure that we're we're compatible, that we get along in this way, that whatever. And yet what God says is those things are all reserved for marriage. And it is called to be the start of something new and something different. And and so what the world says often is like, well, I'm going to kind of ease my way in and make sure we're good roommates and make sure we work together and make sure everything is before I propose. And then maybe I'll get around to that and kind of doing this marriage thing, which is like an old institution and just like a legal, right? Like, That's our own understanding. In our minds, that makes sense. We can say, well, yeah, why would I want to spend my life with someone and not like test them out first? And yet what God says is different. And it takes us saying, God, I trust what you say about marriage because you created it and you know how it's done best. And I'm not going to trust what the world says about these things. And there's a million other examples. Steps of faith aren't foolish decisions. It means we say, God, I trust you with this outcome, even though I don't fully understand it. That takes us being humble, but that also takes us having great faith in who God is. So as we kind of start to wrap some things up tonight, there can be two extremes, I think, when it comes to decision-making. 
And some of this is just determined by your personality and, and kind of how God made you. But the first extreme is everything is by faith. That we're just, we're just making jumps of faith everywhere and we never know, just jump, we'll never know the outcome. And that's not all bad. But some people will say like, well, it's just a leap of faith. I'm like, uh, that's actually just a bad decision, right? Like, um, like yeah, I'm going to propose on the third date. Leap of faith. Okay, let's talk about this. This is probably not a leap of faith. In fact, it's probably a bad decision. But the second extreme, and I'll be honest, I'm more this second one, is I'm not going to make a decision until I hear God tell me exactly what to do. That we can, we can think, man, I'm going to wait. And it doesn't mean he won't, but so many times our decisions are steps of faith and trusting God with the outcome. And there are times that we maybe know what to do or, or whatever, and, and we're afraid and we don't like change. That's me. And, and we don't want to take a step of faith. And we're just waiting for God to speak to us in this particular way. And when we do that as Christians, we can actually miss out on what God is calling us to do because instead of making a decision, we don't make a decision. And we kind of just pull ourselves back and we can miss out on what God would have for us because we're so afraid to take a step of faith and to be courageous. God honors Nehemiah's prayers and his courage and step of faith. And the story is only the beginning. If you want to know how it turns out, we, we don't have time, but check out Nehemiah chapters 2 through 7 tonight before you go to bed. And my guess is you could probably read that in 10, 15 minutes or so and see all that God does because the king says, Go. And Nehemiah gets to play a part in bringing revival to some of God's people. And he does amazing things. But as we kind of drill down here to wrap up, how does Nehemiah's story and decision help us today? Because what we've seen is that wise decision making, wise decision making takes patiently seeking God and it takes steps of faith. It takes both things. That we have to slow down and seek God and we have to be bold and take steps of faith and so tonight, maybe some of you are in the middle of making decision after decision. This is what I want to study. This is where I want to go to school. This is what I want to do with my life. And you haven't actually ever slowed down to say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? God, what do you want me? So often we just go with the flow of what people do and go, well, this is a good school. This is a good job. This will get me good money. I can get at this. And we slow down and we don't say, okay, God, here's all the things that I want to do. In my earthly wisdom, in the knowledge you've given me, this looks like a good plan. But God, I'm going to press pause on that. What do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do with my life? It makes me so sad when Christians kind of just go with the flow of, well, this is what people do. And so I'm just this normal state of life. Maybe, but maybe we're missing what God has for us because we haven't said, God, what do you want with my life? Here's what I want, but I'm willing to say, if that's not it, if you have a better plan for me, where do you want me to go? So many times we just do what makes sense in our minds, right? Our own understanding. And we forget to stop and say, God, how should I live? What should I do? And so for some of us tonight, as we read Nehemiah's story, maybe you need to slow down. And maybe you need to patiently seek God and say for, for just a little bit, I'm not going to make a decision. I'm going to seek God and say, God, what would you have me do? I know we want answers. We want clarity. We want to make decisions. And I know that there's a ton of pressure in high school to know exactly what you're going to do and who you're going to become and how it's all, you know. But sometimes we have to slow down and bring in God into the process of our decision making. And maybe others of you have been really paralyzed by fear about a decision that you've kind of know or, or have a thought of what you would do. And you've prayed and you don't know exactly what God wants you to do. He hasn't spoken to you. And maybe you're afraid of making the wrong choice. I've been there. Or maybe you think you know what God is calling you to do, but you're afraid to follow through because you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe some of you know that God is, is maybe telling you to move on from a friendship or a relationship. Maybe you know God is calling you to apply for a scary job or a college that's not on your top three list. Or maybe you know God is asking you to forgive someone who's harmed you. Or maybe you feel like, man, how could I, maybe I should share my faith. How do I share my faith with someone who has a different faith background? And maybe for some of us, just maybe it's time to step out in faith and to be bold and to make that decision. In all of our decisions, there's going to come a moment when we have to step out and trust that what God says is true and his promises are true and his character is good and he's got us. When we look at decisions, we go, man, it's not a clear sinful and not sinful decision. 
it just seems like there's so many paths and so many options that if we've patiently sought God, there comes a time when we say, man, I need to be bold and take a step of faith and do everything I can to do what I believe God is leading me to do, but to be wise, to make a decision, and to trust the outcome to God who loves you and whose character is trustworthy. It's not a blind jump. It's not a foolish decision. It's saying, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust it in your hands. Here I go. So many big decisions in life are not easy. They can be scary. It may test our faith. But as Nehemiah showed us, if we want to make wise decisions, it's going to take slowing down and being patient and seeking God. And it's also going to take stepping out in faith and having courage and belief that God is who he says he is, and he's going to come through even in the unknown. Wise decision-making takes patiently seeking after God, and it takes steps of faith. Where are you tonight? What do you need to do next? Let us be a people of prayer and closeness with God, but also a people of faith and courage and boldness. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of your people that we can gather, that we can do this. God, I pray that your spirit would be at work in our hearts God, doing what I cannot do, what our leaders cannot do, that you would be convicting, comforting, encouraging, challenging, growing us. God, I pray for those of us who are moving so fast that we've forgotten to slow down and seek you. I pray that you would help us slow down and put our plans and our decisions on hold and to seek your will through prayer and through your word. And God, I pray for those of us, Lord, who are scared, who don't know what decision to make and so we haven't made any and God, I pray you would give us boldness and courage and faith in you being who you say you are so that we could live out and step out in faith. God, we pray that you would continue to be the faithful God to us. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I'm so glad you guys have jumped in with our home groups and, and so many of you I don't see every week and I miss you. And so I'm really looking forward to next week, our large group get together uh, please let your leaders or let me know if you can make that so we can plan best accordingly. But I know things have been different and, and changing in different locations. And man, I'm still looking forward just to catching up, hanging out, and having fun next week. So I hope to see you next week to join our large group hangout. Your leaders have the details. Uh, and RSVP if you can so we can have the best plans possible. But love you guys. Miss you if you're not in my group. If you're in my group, eh, maybe I've had too much of you. Uh, just kidding. But I hope you guys have a great night. On to your discussion questions.